Hi and welcome to my video. My name is Fred Morris. I'm going to be talking about delivering rugby union using the constraints based approach or CBA. During this video we're going to cover why you use CBA, what is CBA and the theory behind it, and then we're going to offer some practical tips and guidelines so that by the end of the video you should be confident enough to go and deliver a session based on the principles of the constraints based approach. So why use CBA? Well, from a coaching development point of view, the RFU have based all their coaching awards from level 2 upwards around the principles and theories of the constraints-based approach, which is fine in theory, but if you're not from a coaching or academic background, it's highly unlikely that you've come across this before. So before you go on to your coaching courses, a firm grasp of the fundamental principles of the constraint-based approach will help you achieve your awards. So from a more practical coaching perspective, traditional drill-based approaches are limited because they can't replicate the dynamic changing environments of a game. So even though they're good at showing someone how to do something, they can't show the context and when to do it. So they're somewhat limited in their ability to develop key decision making skills. What the constraints based approach does is allow the coach to manipulate certain aspects of the game. However, it keeps, you can keep things very realistic in order to bring out certain skills under game, game like pressure, which you can't do at all during traditional drill based sessions. The constraints based approach stems from the ecological dynamic approach to skill learning. This views the human body as a complex system or organism with the capacity to self organize, and learning is a result of inter interaction with the environment. The environment imposes constraints, and therefore, both performance and learning are a result of interaction with the constraints imposed by the environment. This can be, for example, a game of rugby, where the individual organizes itself to produce a solution to the problems of the constraints that are imposed on it by the game of rugby. The constraints are organized into three categories, individual, environment and task. Individual constraints are those that are inherent to that person or group, such as experience cognitive ability, passing ability, agility, speed. These are all examples of individual constraints. Environmental constraints are the effect of the environment on that person. For example, the size of the training area, the surface of the training area, whether it's muddy, whether the ground is hard or not. And also, these can also be the effect of the opposition in that environment on that person or group. Finally, task constraints are the rules of the game and how they affect that person. So by manipulating the constraints, coaches can change their behaviours whilst keeping the participants under realistic game-like scenario. So what is the constraints-based approach then? Well, it is a games-based approach that is non-linear in its features, as in that it doesn't have a clear beginning, middle and an end. So all the content is the same. The coach manipulates intensity and also learning by manipulating the constraints of the game. So the environmental, individual and task constraints to achieve different objectives. Although crucially, Key learning points are reinforced by using questioning to get the participants to think about their actions and how they dealt with the situation and the constraints to bring a successful outcome. So what does the constraints-based approach look like then? Well, even though it's simple in nature, it's actually quite hard to visualize. To help with that, we've got two games with different objectives. Game 1, the objectives are to spot and exploit space. 
the rules, a normal touch rugby rule, and the player places the ball on the floor between their legs when touched. The defender to touch the player retreats the, the try line when touched and only then can they get back into the game. This ensures that a space is left for the attack to spot and exploit. Okay, Freddy, go back! Touch there, Freddy, go back again! No, get back in. Touch there, Harry, go back! During game one, we manipulated two constraints, task and environmental. The task constraint was that defenders had to retreat back to their try line. This removed them from their defensive line, which should have given the attackers more space to attack. The environmental constraint was that we used a large area. This had two effects. This made it harder for the defence to reach the attack, but also it made it easier for the attack to go round the defence because they had the space to do so. Game 2 is slightly different. It focuses on the counter-attacking abilities of the team. The objective is still to score, however, task constraints are, s are slightly different as well. The touch rugby rules, however, the opposition team has to kick the ball to the attacking team who have to try and score. They have three touches to do so. The individual constraints are that mistakes result in turnovers, that is that if they make a mistake, the other team has the opportunity to attack and they have to defend. Environmental constraints are that when the attack score, an extra defender is added to the defending team, making it harder for them to score. Last one! Last one! <laughs> Board pass, turn over! White's up the top! There was! Right on the top! Go on in. Guys, get back. Whites, get down there. Okay, let's go. Two, just two, just two. Well played. Has he got the gas? He's in. Good try. On. Oh, I'll give you that, Harry. Three. Three defenders. Go on in. Go. Yeah, match you up here. Touch there, that's one. Get on side, get on side, get on side. Well done, Dan. Good, good line speed. That's much better. Spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out. Come on. Oh, play on. That was one hand. Go on. Awesome. Okay, four. Guys. Okay, guys. White's coming. White's coming. Come in. Right, guys. Hold on a second. Guys, when we're. What have, we got, right, what have we got to do when we first catch the ball? We go forward, we're standing yeah, there we and go coming up on us, right? we're losing. Yeah, so we go forward and what's that do? That sucks out. the defence into you, doesn't it? So it creates a space out wide. Yeah. So once we've created the space out wide, what, right, what do we do then? Wide. Exactly, right? So it's not, it's not complicated, is it? It's a really simple right. So how many touches have we got? Three. Three, yeah. Okay, so we don't have to go wide straight away do we? We just draw the draw the defence in and play wide. Yep, simple rugby. So okay. The ball, okay, four. Okay. No one no one's got past four yet guys, so see if you can. That's it, that's it. Oh go go go! Oh <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay, five! Even though both of the games had different objectives, they both demonstrated the ability of constraints-based approach to develop decision-making skills and situational awareness. They both required the players to assess the situation that they were in and what was in front of them and the constraints that the games placed in them and come up with a solution to either support the ball carrier or score themselves. So it's a very learner bit orientated approach where the coach becomes more of a facilitator than a teacher. This can only be positive because during a game, even though a coach can give you instructions and tell the players what to do, the ultimate decision making is down to the players themselves. So developing instinctive, reactive players can only be beneficial towards their game. Furthermore, historically, there's been a tendency to focus on the physiological side of performance such as VO2 max, maximal power output, strength and speed. However, there's very little training afforded to cognitive and decision making skills. And therefore, as the constraint based approach is able to train both at the same time, it becomes a very important part of particularly the team based sport coach's repertoire. And finally, practical tips. Always try and plan for success. For example, if you want the drill to focus on attacking skills like I did, always try and ensure that the, pos the attacking team has always got the advantage. And similarly, if you want to plan for defensive drills, always make sure that the defensive team has got the advantage. Secondly, always reinforce positive behaviour. So if someone does something good, give them some positive feedback and they're more likely to adopt that behaviour. And then finally, understand what the constraints are and what they can do to your, um, to your game. For example, if I made the area too small, that would allow the defence to get to the attack easier. So that would have made it more of a, a defensive operation, particularly in game two. In game one, if I made it too wide, it's highly likely that it wouldn't be able to pass the distance that's required to take advantage of the space. So you need to be aware of what your constraints are and what, what you can manipulate. Like game one, there was no need to manipulate individual constraints so I didn't bother. So it's up to you as a coach to decide what you want to manipulate and what you don't want to manipulate.